What happens when you face a difficult situation? It could be in your professional life or your personal life, or it could be in a project that you're working on where you hit an impasse, you don't know what to do next, you get writer's block, whatever the case may be. Well, at first you're gonna have a visceral reaction. You're gonna get sad, you're gonna get angry, you're gonna get frustrated, you're gonna feel lost. And eventually you'll accept the reality of the situation and start working on a solution. Well, we're taught when we face challenges in life that we need to roll our sleeves up and face these challenges head on and work hard to find a solution. And that works, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes no matter how hard you work, a solution doesn't come to you. And today I'm here to talk to you about a different perspective on facing those kinds of challenges. That when you're facing those challenges where you can't come up with a solution, no matter how hard you're beating your head against the wall, you need to disconnect and stop trying so hard and stop beating your head against the wall and great solutions will present themselves to you. And to demonstrate that, I'd like to share my story of how I got to where I am today. See, I'm a business owner. I own the Digital Arts Experience right here in Scarsdale. And Digital Arts Experience provides awesome after-school programs and summer camps for kids in technology. We teach game design, we teach coding, 3D printing, laser cutting, animation, video production, you name it. I'm also a college professor. I teach ideation and design thinking at the Heinz Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Iona College. And if you asked me when I was 15, 17, or even 20 years old, if by the time I was 35 I'd be a business owner, and be a college professor, I would have looked at you like you had three heads. And truth be told, I spent my entire early life being fixated on being in the music business. See, when I was a kid, I loved gadgets and technology. I loved my Game Boy. In fact, here's a picture of, a, of a, me at about four years old allowing my brother to use my Game Boy. I loved taking electronics apart and seeing how they worked. I just loved cool gadgets. I also loved music. Now, throughout my years, I learned several instruments. I played the violin, I played the trumpet, I have an accordion, I play the sitar, and of course, I learned to play the guitar. And by the time I was in eighth grade, I started dabbling with writing my own music. So for my 14th birthday, my dad got me a Tascam four-track cassette recorder, which I still have today, and it still works. Um, and I had no idea what multi-track recording was at that time. I didn't know anything about music technology. So I got this thing, I didn't really, really know what to do with it, and I started tinkering with it, and then all of a sudden, music technology became my entire life. I mean, this was the perfect marriage between my love for gadgets and technology and my love for music. And I knew at that point that I was destined to be a recording engineer and work in recording studios, helping bands actualize their creative vision and working with all the cool technology in the studio. But the thing is, in the late 90s and the, and the early 2000s, there was no garage band. I mean, computers didn't come bundled with free, powerful recording software. In fact, when I was in middle school, it was a technological marvel to have a laptop with built-in wireless internet. I mean, to have a home recording setup was unheard of. I mean, you needed to spend thousands of dollars for a souped-up computer and all this equipment to record music. So... In early high school, I had no access to explore music technology. I was basically limited to reading audio engineering magazines at the borders in White Plains and playing with my four track in the basement. So I spent most of high school playing with my four track and playing in a heavy metal band. And I was lucky enough my junior year of high school to get an internship through school at a studio in Manhattan. As a 17 year old kid in a professional recording studio with absolutely no skill because I had nowhere to learn it, I basically sat in the corner and made coffee and ran errands and did the typical recording studio intern stuff. I did get to watch professional recording sessions in progress and I did learn a lot, but I was hungry to get my hands on the gear. I mean, I wanted to experiment with microphones and EQs and compressors and learn about all this cool technology and use patch bays and all this cool stuff. And I couldn't do that. But everything changed for me my sophomore year of college for two reasons. One, I joined the Live Mix Club at uh, Emerson's radio station. Emerson's radio station, WERS, was the most listened to college radio station in the country at that point. And they had this incredible studio that had real bands come in and broadcast live performances on air. And Live Mix was a student-run club and we were all responsible for the audio engineering for those live broadcasts. Not only that, I got keys to the studio so I could go in and use the studio at any time that it wasn't booked. So you know I was in the studio at five o'clock in the morning at least three days a week because that was the only time it was available experimenting and mixing and, and honing my skills. 
Now, the other reason my experience changed is I got an awesome summer internship that I stuck with through the rest of college at a recording studio in Manhattan called Manhattan Center Productions. Now, this was a multi-million dollar studio that worked with A-list artists like Timbaland, Duran Duran, Jay-Z, Madonna. And over the years, I developed trust with the management there, and they let me come in and, and use the equipment after hours and even assist an engineer on some pretty big name sessions. And it was an amazing real world experience. So I graduated college with these new skills and I was hungry to get in the studio and start working with their bands and making their creative dreams come true. And I got a job working at a studio, uh, an awesome studio on Long Island called Media Recording. Wasn't crazy about the name, but the studio was beautiful. It was built by the same acoustical architect as Jimi Hendrix Studio in Manhattan. So it looked like a mini version of Electric Lady and it sounded amazing and it had amazing equipment. But it was the summer of 2008 during the economic downturn. And nobody had big budgets for recording. In fact, recording studios were closing left and right. And so as a result of that, uh, the studio couldn't pick and choose the sessions that we booked. I mean, we had to take any session that would come in. And I basically spent the majority of my time recording high school bands and artists that wanted to record 10 songs in four hours. Now, I did get a couple of great bands in there and had some really cool experiences. But for the most part, the work was kind of unfulfilling. In addition to that, my boss would say things to me like, don't use keyboard shortcuts in Pro Tools because if you do it the slow way, it adds more billable time to recording sessions. And, and that didn't resonate with me. I wanted to build relationships with artists and not watch the clock. I wanted to spend time with them in the studio, being creative and actualizing their creative visions. In addition to that, I was working crazy hours. I mean, I'd arrive at the studio when the sun was rising and I'd leave when the sun was rising and there were no windows. It was like a time warp. So I spent all this time in the studio recording, frankly, unfulfilling work because we had to, and just spent so much time in there that I stopped listening to music for pleasure. I mean, I, I, my ears were so tired from mixing so many hours that I, I really couldn't bring myself to listen to music for fun anymore. And after almost two years of that, I just got so beat down and so frustrated. All of my passion was gone for music that I decided to leave. I left the music business and I didn't know what to do next. I, mean, I was completely lost. I spent the greater part of my life fixated on being in the music business. And when it came time to do that, it, it, it wasn't what I expected. It was very different. And, and I did not know what to do next. I was lost. I was depressed. I just didn't know what to do. So I got a job at the Apple Store in Greenwich to get a paycheck and to get health insurance and keep me busy. And it was fun. It was fun. It was a nice distraction because I got to work around really cool technology. I got to teach people how to use their new computers. They were all excited about their new Mac and I was excited to teach them about it. And it was a nice distraction, but I knew in the back of my mind that that wasn't the last stop for me. I, you know, I wanted to do something more than that. And I really didn't know what to do, so I got to work. I got to work, I started doing research and I started meeting with career counselors and I started uh, meeting with people in different industries and talking to them, trying to figure out some path for me and I just got nowhere. I mean, I didn't know what to do. Nothing was resonating with me. I was putting in all this work and just getting nowhere. So I just stopped. I figured I'll bide my time at Apple and see if something comes my way and it did. One night I was hanging out with my best friend, Mike, who I've known since I was seven, and we were reminiscing of the old days of high school, talking about our heavy metal band and skateboarding and all this stuff. And somehow or another, uh, the topic of my experience being obsessed with audio engineering and not having anywhere to do that came up. And right away, he commiserated with me about that experience. You know, in his case, he was a super talented artist, still is a super talented artist. And he had done the drawing and painting thing, but he was interested in other mediums. He was interested in, you know, welding and, and carpentry and, and, and vacuum forming and all these things that he couldn't really do in school. And, 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 and I thought for a second, well, if you had the same experience and I had the same experience, why is there nowhere for kids at a young age to explore the things they're passionate about? I mean, there are plenty of after-school clubs, but for me, I mean, there was nowhere for me to explore cool techie stuff. I mean, I, there was no recording studio. There was no video production studio that I could go and play around with. And that's where the idea for the digital arts experience came to be. I figured, let me give the kids the experience that I didn't have when I was in high school. I had no idea how to start a business in there. I, I, my entire life was fixated on music technology. I didn't know about business. I didn't know about starting a business. I didn't know the first thing about it. So I got to work. I started doing a little research. 
Uh, I started meeting with a family friend who had a lot of entrepreneurial experience and he quickly became my mentor. We had breakfast once a week, talked about the things I was doing, the things I should be doing, and gave me general advice on the process of starting a business. And not only that, when I was at the Apple store, I was teaching parents how to use their new computers. So while I was there, I talked to them about the idea. What classes should I offer? For what ages? How long is a, an ideal class? What would be a good summer camp format? And as I was able to get real market research about the parents who would be signing their kids up for my classes. And after almost two years of hard work, I left my job at Apple and through the support of my mentor and my family, I opened the digital arts experience in 2012. And so here I am in my early 20s, no idea what to do next. I have a business, I have no idea what to do. But I started to build my team. I started to interview people to, to be instructors for the team. And you know, when you meet somebody and you get that good gut feeling about them, you know, oh, this person's gonna be, gonna be a good fit. Well, anybody that I got that good gut feeling from all said, I wish I had something like this when I was a kid. You know, and that, and that, that gave me confidence that the idea was a good idea, that this was a real need, that I wasn't the only one that felt that frustration as a kid. And I built this incredible team. I mean, the, the team at the DA is the lifeblood of the DA. That's what we're all about, this incredible group of creative people. And it took some time, but we started running classes. We ran one class, we ran two classes, two classes became four classes. And before we knew it, we had this crazy summer camp with hundreds of kids coming through. We were hiring new people and buying new technology and introducing new programs. Everything was going great. And then the STEM craze happened. All of a sudden, every single after-school provider had a STEM class, and every kid needed to learn how to code. Everybody was buying a 3D printer. And I knew our classes were great, and I knew that they would stand up to, to more competition, but we did see our enrollment drop because there were STEM programs that were popping up a little closer to home to some of our parents, and it might have been a little bit more convenient. I got worried. I was frustrated. I was scared. And I said to myself, how could this be happening? Everything was going so well. How could this be happening? And eventually, you know, I accepted the reality of the situation and I got to work. I started doing research and talking to people and coming up with new uh, class formats and trying this and trying that and nothing was working. I really didn't know what to do. I was getting so frustrated, beating my head against the wall, trying to come up with new formats to try and make the DAE stand out and nothing was happening and I just kind of kind of gave up trying. So... While this is going on, I'm, one day I'm talking to my dad and we were just joking about crazy ideas for the DA, you know, buying this crazy piece of equipment and trying this insane new class format, just as a joke, we were laughing about it. And he's laughing at me and he said, you should, you should build a classroom in an RV. And I stopped and I said, wait a second, that's a great idea. And that's where the idea for Digital Arts Express came about. We took a sprinter and built a classroom in the back of it that we could fit 10 kids in. We had Wi-Fi, we had power, we had all the technology needed to take a classroom from our facility and bring it on the road. And schools started booking it. I mean, it made our programs more accessible. We could bring all the technology needed for one of our classes. We could bring an entire classroom anywhere to libraries, to youth organizations, to schools that may not have had the space or the technology. And that launched an entirely new facet of our business. Since then, we've built a huge equipment room full of mobile kits where we can bring laptops and all the necessary technology into schools to run classes. And since then, we've taught classes at dozens of schools to literally thousands of students all over Westchester. So for the past eight years, we've dealt with a lot of different challenges. You know, we've had new people join the team and people leave the team and had enrollment change and tried new formats that failed. And I've certainly made enough mistakes than we have time to talk about. But as a team, we got through them because the team at the DA is the most amazing team I've ever worked with in my life. And we faced all the challenges and we got through them. And then in March, COVID came around. You know, at first, I didn't want to acknowledge that the coronavirus was as bad as it was being made out to be. Because in the back of my mind, I knew that if it was, we were gonna be in a challenging situation at the digital arts experience. And it was as bad as they said. And before long, everything was shut down. Part of what the DA has always been about is the learning environment, people coming together and collaborating and learning new skills and making new friends. And we couldn't have in-person classes. And I was angry and I was frustrated. But more than that, I was sad. I very realistically acknowledged that the digital arts experience might have to close. And I was sad that I would have to talk to my team and tell them that we were closing and they would need to find new jobs. But 
My team and I rallied together and my core team, Lori, Emily, and Nick are some of the most intelligent, hardworking, and passionate people I've ever met. And we rallied together as a team and we said, you know what? We accept the situation. Let's see if we can figure this out. And we started working out solutions, but we didn't go into crisis mode. What we did is we met at 11 a.m. every day of the week on Google Meet and we made a point to laugh, have a little fun, and start throwing out crazy ideas. Exploring all the options, because why not? We had nothing to lose. So we started looking at what loans were available. We started looking at what free versions of the software we use existed so we could make online programs more accessible. We started experimenting with different online class formats to really facilitate collaboration, even if we couldn't be in person. We built online collaborative gaming sessions just to give kids something fun to do with their friends because they couldn't see them in person. And we ran a super successful summer program where we brought kids together, we had fun. We built things as a team, we collaborated. And more than that, we made the DAE programs more accessible because they were online and we taught kids all over the country. And as a team, we got through it. So you may be asking yourself, that's a great story, but what's the point? Well, for the past few years teaching at Iona College, it's been my job to help college students come up with great ideas and execute them. And I've put them through dozens of ideation techniques, all kind of wacky stuff. The one thing that reigns true through all of these different exercises is that the best ideas and the best solutions come when we're at play and when our minds are disconnected, when we're having fun. I mean, that's why you get great ideas when you're standing in the shower because your mind's not fixated on anything. You're just drifting in space. When I left the music business and I felt totally lost, the idea of the DAE didn't come from me sitting in front of my computer and writing out pages of notes and doing all this research. It came from me having fun with my friend, reminiscing of the old days. When we faced the challenge of the STEM craze at the digital arts experience and saw our, our enrollment drop, you know, we didn't spend all this time doing market research and trying out new formats. Well, we did try new formats and they didn't work. The idea of the Digital Arts Express came from just joking around with my dad and having fun and throwing crazy ideas out there. And when COVID came around, we survived by coming together as a team and making it a point to laugh and have fun together and throw out crazy ideas. Because like I said, we had nothing to lose. So we might as well have a little fun and throw out some crazy ideas. The point is that when you're faced with a challenge, it's okay to have that visceral reaction at first. It's okay to go into crisis mode. It's okay to feel angry, to feel lost, to feel sad, to feel frustrated. But if you embrace the situation and put aside your feelings of anger, frustration, and embrace the chaos of what's going on, great solutions will reveal themselves to you. I'm not trying to discount hard work. I mean, we put in tons of hard work to bring these solutions to life. But the ideas of these solutions came from when we were joking around or having fun or at play, but not feeling stressed out, not feeling anger, not feeling frustration, embracing the reality of the situation, putting those visceral feelings aside, and being creative. You can't force good ideas. You know, if you've ever tried to come up with a good idea and you sit there beating your head against the table, they don't come. They come when you least expect it. So surround yourself with people that inspire you. Make it a point to laugh. Do something wacky and fun. Good ideas will come from that. Step back and laugh at how crazy the situation is. Remove yourself from it so that you can be creative. Put yourself in a state of mind that facilitates ideation and creativity. And these challenges will no longer look like challenges but opportunities for new possibilities. Thank you.